Mark Simmer here. I work for the Department of Employment and Economic Development. I work in the Small Business Assistance Office, and I help start these calls and manage the calls. Uh, we do this monthly, uh, second Tuesday of every month. Today's the 10th, September. We will have this uh, meeting recorded and posted. I put the link in the chat, uh, but you can also find, you can get to it from the uh, DEED website um, at mn.gov slash deed today we're going to be speaking about the uh, minnesota paid leave program that deed will be uh, administering and i am looking for our staff that we're going to have hopefully present today uh looking for uh linda um or greg just want to see if they will pop yep. in the uh, message here. i'm, I'm here mark great time is of essence, so let's not waste any time. Let's welcome uh, Greg Norfleet, the director of the Minnesota Paid Leave Program. Hi, everybody, um, and thanks so much for the opportunity to present again uh, with the small business call. Uh, we get a ton of great input from this group uh, that's really going to be helping out with our implementation effort. Um, before we get started, do you just want to Give you a bit of a preview of where we're going to go today. Um, so we've got three parts of the presentation. One is a quick overview of what the program is. Uh, next, a bit of an update on our implementation efforts to date and some key milestones on the horizon. And then last, uh, a bit of a preview of what the role of the employer is going to look like within the program. Uh, we'll also open up for some questions and answers, which are super valuable to us because we're really trying, uh, we're really trying to get back in. Uh, early uh, from a variety of different stakeholders, including uh, small employers whose uh, experience really matters to the program. There you go. <laughs> That's right. Oh, just ask you. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Greg, let me just uh, jump in quick. This is Mark Simmer again. If people could mute themselves uh, during the meeting until we have a question and answer period, that'd be great. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, no problem at all. Um, so, uh, let me share my screen real quick. Uh, so we we'll have a quick presentation for you all. This should last about 20 minutes, and then we'll jump straight into questions and answers to get uh, some of your questions answered before uh, uh, the end of the call. Um, so before we get into it, um, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, moments. Uh, so the paid leave program is really about moments, big moments in your life. Uh, some of these are important, are happy moments, like welcoming a new child to your family, Others are much more challenging, uh, such as dealing with a cancer diagnosis or another serious healthcare condition of, for yourself or for a loved one. Um, we know that those experiences matter to your employees, but they also matter to you as an employer. Uh, so these are big moments for you as well, um, where you're missing a key employee for your business or you just want to be there to support them. Um, one thing, uh, being somewhat new to Minnesota, I moved here in October of last year uh, after previously being the deputy director for operations for the Massachusetts program uh, that went live in 2021. Uh, but having been in Minnesota for just about a year now, um, one of the key things that I've learned is that there's a culture of taking care of one another here um, in ways big and small, uh, whether that is helping uh, dig your neighbor out uh, after a big snowstorm, or one of the big news stories when I got here was a crash on I-35, uh, where regular, ordinary Minnesotans pulled off uh, to the side of the road and helped pull somebody out of flaming wreckage. Um, in ways big and small, uh, part of being a Minnesotan is taking care of each other uh, when, when you need it. We view our program as kind of an extension of that ethos, uh, that the paid leave program is here to support people when they need time to care for themselves and for their loved ones. The benefit to your employees is fairly obvious um, that it helps build connections in their families, communities and workplaces. And this has been sorted out by research evidence for programs that have already gone live, uh, where we've seen improved uh, maternal and child health um, in programs that have launched uh, across the country. But it's also a benefit to employers. Uh, we've seen across other implementations that paid leave programs increase employer retention, as well as improve performance and morale while on the job. Our goal uh, for establishing a paid leave program is to help, help Minnesotans be there for one another and to help uh, your employees not have to choose between financial stability and being there for their families during those big moments. 
So to start off with a bit of history on the law, uh, the paid leave law was enacted in May 2023 and was updated during the last legislative session. The law creates a paid family and medical leave insurance program uh, that will be available to Minnesota workers beginning on January 1st, 2026. This law provides both job protections and partial wage replacements. Those partial wage replacements will be paid directly by the state to individuals who take leave for a qualifying condition. So unlike ESST, this is a benefit that's paid directly by the state, not by the employer. Um, those qualifying conditions will go into a little bit of depth, but it includes welcoming a child to your home, as well as recovering for a serious healthcare condition or caring for someone with, their, with a serious healthcare condition. The program is going to be funded by premiums that are made up from contributions between employers and employees. And for folks on this call, uh, there is a reduced premium uh, for small businesses in Minnesota. So it will be cheaper as a small business to participate in the program. The program is split into two major buttons, medical leave and family leave. Medical leave is exactly what it sounds like. It's time to care for yourself after you experience a serious health care condition. Uh, these are long, uh, long leaves, uh, at least seven days in duration in order to qualify under the program. And in order to be approved for a leave, you're going to need to provide uh, documentation from a serious, from a healthcare provider that the leave is medically necessary uh, for you to be out for that extended period of time. Family leave is a little bit broader than medical leave. It includes welcoming a child to your home, uh, whether through birth, foster care, or adoption, caring for a loved one uh, with their own serious health care condition, as well as providing support for survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault, and for our military during active deployments, whether domestically or abroad. The program offers up to 12 weeks of medical leave and up to 12 weeks of family leave in a single benefit year but an individual is limited to taking 20 weeks within a benefit year of combined leave, meaning that you could take eight weeks of medical and eight weeks of family, but you couldn't take 12 of each uh, type. The program's very broad. Uh, it covers nearly every Minnesota employer, regardless of the business size, uh, amount of revenue, or the number of employees that you may have. This includes full-time, part-time, temporary, hourly, interns. Almost any uh, permutation of employment is covered under the paid leave law. The only exceptions are independent contractors and self-employed individuals who aren't required to participate in the program by default, but will be given the opportunity to opt in closer to implementation. There's also a very narrow exclusion for certain seasonal hospitality employees. Um, I'll cover that in a little bit more depth later on in the presentation. So I mentioned the program has both partial wage replacements and job protections. Replacements are going to be paid on a progressive scale when an individual is out on a qualified leave. What that means is that those who make the least have the highest percentage of their wages replaced while they're out on leave. The actual math here is that wages between zero and 50% of the statewide average weekly wage are replaced at 90%. Wages between 50% and 100% of the statewide average weekly wage are replaced at 66%. And wages above the statewide average weekly wage are replaced at 50% up to a cap of the statewide a benefit amount of the statewide average weekly wage. I know that's uh, difficult math, um, and we don't expect you to do it by yourself. Sooner, when we get closer to implementation, we'll create tools uh, that will allow you to be able to see what your benefit would look like given your own individual circumstances. Individuals will be eligible to qualify for uh, partial wage replacements if they earn at least 5.3% of the statewide average annual wage in the past four completed calendar quarters. That value was about $3,684 in 2023. So it's a fairly low uh, barrier to entry. Job protections are different. Um, so they are different than the partial wage replacements. Uh, they do apply to both large and small businesses. And if an employee takes a leave under the program, they'll need to be restored to the same position or an equivalent position 
with the same pay, status, benefits, length of service, and seniority as they enjoyed prior to taking that leave. Job protections under the program kick in 90 days following the date of employment. So these two things are different. In order to qualify for job protections, it's a length of tenure, 90 days. In order to qualify for benefits or financial benefits, it's a earnings threshold of 5.3% of the statewide average annual wage. So that's a really quick overview of what the program is. The next part, we wanna give you kind of an insight of how implementation is working. One of the cool things about paid leave is that it's a brand new program, which means that we don't have legacy data, legacy systems, or legacy ways of doing business, which means that we're able to take in uh, feedback from a variety of different audiences in order to create tools that add value. Um, so part of when we get to the Q&A, we really do value your questions because that is how we're going to make sure that this product is responsive to the needs of small businesses. So as we're building, one thing to know is that we're not the first ones to build something like this. Uh, we're going to be the 13th state to implement a paid leave program. Um, and we're able to leverage a lot from these states that have already gone before. Uh, this includes policy, process, and technology choices. Um, and we're in contact with every single state uh, that has an existing paid leave program, as well as states that are hoping to launch in the next few years. Um, and we're sharing best practices so that when we launch in Minnesota, we're going to be the best implementation yet of a paid leave program because we're building off of what already exists elsewhere. We're also getting a ton of support from within state government, not just with uh, Neela and the Office of Small Business Innovations team, but uh, we also have support from across the entire enterprise. So the Department of Labor and Industry is partnering with us to manage the job protection provisions under the law. Uh, I should have started with, we are the paid leave division. We're a new division within the Department of Employment and Economic Development. And our key responsibilities are building out this program and making benefit payments to folks when they're out on a qualified leave. The Department of Labor and Industry is, has oversight over the job protection provisions. And then we're partnering with the Department of Commerce on private plan administration. So under the statute, an employer may choose to offer these benefits by themselves rather than paying, rather than going through the state plan. In order to qualify for a private plan exemption, you'll need to have a plan that is at least as generous as the state plan. That includes the job protection provisions, as well as the duration of leave and the uh, benefit amount that somebody would receive during a qualified leave. There are two ways that an individual may have a, an ex may qualify for a private plan exemption. Uh, the first is they could purchase a plan from a private carrier. Uh, someone like uh, MetLife or Aflac will start selling uh, products in Minnesota probably early next year. Uh, we're partnering with the Department of Commerce to help build that marketplace uh, so that there are plans that meet the requirements for qualifying for an exemption available for sale within Minnesota. There's also an option for an employer to, uh, so they could, instead of buying a private uh, plan through a carrier or going through the state, you could choose to pay the benefits on your own uh, for your employees. This will require uh, the same level of benefits, length, and job protections that are included in the state plan as well. It will also have a surety bond requirement where the employer will need to submit a surety bond to the division uh, to cover the potential cost of contributions if the plan does not uh, follow through. Um, but we're partnering with the Department of Commerce there as well to review plans uh, to help us make sure that whatever plans are submitted comply with the requirements of the law. And last, we have a really innovative partnership with the D Division of Unemployment Insurance. Uh, we're partnering with them early on in our implementation effort to really reduce the bur administrative burden for employers to participate for wage detail reporting, as well as when we go live, premium collection. Last but not least, and the most important group uh, that we're working with today are groups like you. Um, your input really matters in how this product is going to look. 
Uh, since I arrived, uh, we've done over 100 engagement sessions with a variety of different stakeholders. And it's important that we're getting out there and talking to a large variety of people because paid leave looks different depending on where you sit. It looks different for small employers or large employers. It looks different for the insurance industry or for medical providers. Uh, we made it a priority to make sure that we are getting in contact with as diverse of an audience as possible so that we're able to get input that's going to help us form not just the policy, but the, techn the technology that we're eventually going to implement to make sure that it creates an asset for our businesses in Minnesota. Um, as part of this and uh, part of our ongoing public meetings uh, so far, we're also on a tour of uh, Greater Minnesota, uh, which we do publish on our website. Uh, all of the dates, if you want to see us in person, uh, we are making trips across the state currently. Um, in addition to that, we're also gathering public input through a process called rulemaking. Rulemaking is a way that state agencies adopt rules, um, which are things that are either A, unclear in the legislation, or B, the legislature told the division to figure it out. Um, this process is a public facing process that allows the public to weigh in on rules prior to them going into effect. We're finalizing draft rules in a variety of different areas uh, that you can see on your screen now. Uh, over the summer, we also hosted 19 virtual engagement sessions that drew over 950 attendees and generated over 600 written comments uh, to help us understand how these rules would be how these rules would affect a variety of different types of stakeholders. But this process is not over. Uh, so there's still time to weigh in on the rules uh, to support the paid leave program. In the November timeframe, uh, we're going to issue a public request for comments with draft rules for a review. Uh, when those rules go up, uh, there will be a 30 day here, uh, 30 day uh, public comment period uh, where you can weigh in on all the topics that you see on your screen. In order to prepare for that, we also have a rulemaking portion of our rulemaking section on our website uh, where we have created a topic guide. Uh, that topic guide can give you some insight into our current thinking on each one of these topics. So you, you're coming in prepared uh, when the draft rules are published. So a few key milestones that are on the horizon. So we just mentioned in November, we're looking to publish a public request for comment. Uh, to support our rulemaking. The end of next month, October 31st, 2024, the first quarterly wage detail report is due. We're going to cover that in a little bit more depth as well in just a minute. As I mentioned, private plan guidance is going to first be available at the end of this year, sometime during the fall of this year. And then we're going to open up for applications uh, early next year uh, for businesses that wish to provide these benefits on their own instead of going through the state. We'll also be launching community outreach grants starting in July of 2025. Uh, this is a pool of money dedicated to supporting uh, employers, employees, and self-employed individuals be able to interact with the program. So this is funding that is available to support communication, outreach, and technical assistance to employers as well as us employees. Uh, there is a notification requirement that folks should be aware of on December 1st, 2025. We'll cover that in a little bit of depth as well. And then on 2026, the program goes live, uh, both for benefits and leaves being available so employees can start taking leaves and receiving partial wage replacement while they're out. But payroll deductions will also go live on that date. Uh, the first returns that we're going to talk about are for informational purposes only. No premium is due at this time. The first premiums that are going to be due are going to be on April 30th, 2026, and that'll be for wages earned between January 1st, 2026 and March 31st, 2026. On the same day, uh, we're going to launch small business assistance funding. Uh, this is something we'll talk about in a little bit more depth at the end of the presentation, but it's funding dedicated to help small businesses uh, when an employee is out on leave. So the last part of the presentation that we want to walk through today is just giving you kind of a little bit of an overview of what it's going to look like to interact with the program as an employer. 
employers are a key uh, part of a successful paid leave program. Uh, the program works best when an employer and an employee are on the same page before they ever come to the state. And we want to create a process that really values that relationship and helps employers be an active participant. So we think of it in four different buckets. Uh, educating and informing your employees about the program, reporting wages and submitting premiums to fund the program, supporting leave administration, coordination of benefits while somebody is out on leave, and then working with us to collaborate and improve the program over time. Uh, we'll go through each one of these in a little bit of depth. So starting off with informing your employees. Research from other states has shown uh, that the most effective messengers for paid leave are the employers themselves. Uh, most people learn about benefits like paid leave through their employer. And so we want to prepare you to be effective and enthusiastic messengers for the program for your employees to be able to take advantage of it. There are two major uh, notification requirements that need to happen by December 1st, 2025. The first is hanging a workforce poster in a conspicuous place in English and any language spoken by more than five employees. Uh, this is a really similar requirement to workers' compensation or earn sick and save time or a lot of other wage and hour type programs. Uh, closer to implementation, we will create this poster, uh, translate it into a variety of different languages and make that available for download on our website. There's also a notification or a requirement for employers to notify each employee individually in their native language within 30 days of hire or 30 days before premium collection begins about the availability of benefits. That's where the December 1st, 2025 date comes from, is that employers need to notify their employees individually by December 1st, 2025. We'll again support you by creating a model notification letter, making it available in multiple languages and available for download on our website closer to implementation. This last bucket's kind of narrow. Uh, it's a requirement for notification for a seasonal employee. So I mentioned earlier that there's a small exclusion under the law for seasonal employees under the statute. Here's how narrow it is. It's a three-part test. Part one, is your business seasonal? Uh, the way that we'll define that is that 66% of your gross receipts are collected during six months of the year. Uh, gross receipts has the same definition as what you would report to uh, DOR. 66% uh, of your receipts are received in six months of the year. You're seasonal for the purposes of the paid leave program. Test number two, are you in hospitality? Hospitality is a defined term in our statute, and it refers back to a list that has a number of businesses, including resorts, food trucks, restaurants, uh, hotels. But there is a limited list of businesses that qualify as hospital hospitality under the statute. So assuming that you are both seasonal and your business is in hospitality, the last test is that the employee can work no more than 150 days within a calendar year. So the way that we're going to operationalize this is that we're going to need employers to first be able to designate as seasonal hospitality employers. Uh, and then after they pass those first two tests, they'll be able to designate individual employees as seasonal hospitality workers if they work less than 150 days. By doing that, they are not required to participate in the program. Uh, the employee is not required to participate in the program, uh, meaning that they don't have to have uh, premium or payroll deductions taken out of their check. Uh, they, their wages won't count towards the financial eligibility threshold in the law. This is going to be a process that we're going to really detail uh, closer to implementation, but one of the major requirements of it is that when an employee is designated as a seasonal hospitality worker, that they're notified of their status. We're setting up an application process uh, that will allow 
uh, that will create notification letters in multiple languages to make sure that employers are able to meet that requirement. I know it's very narrow, but just worth mentioning. OK, so that's the informed bucket of work. Next, reporting wages and paying premiums to support the program. Um, so we mentioned that deadline is coming up. October 31st, 2024 is the first wage detail report that's due to this due to the state. Um, early on, uh, starting last year, we when we were speaking with employers, one of the first major pieces of feedback that we received was that they really wanted us to limit administrative burden as much as possible. And they pointed to the tax system as a particular area of concern. Uh, they didn't want us to build our own tax system and with their own login and our own rules. We heard that loud and clear. And so we embarked on a pretty unique relationship with our unemployment division to create a process where the vast majority of employers have no action to take in advance of October 31st in order to be in compliance. The way that we did that is that if you already participate in the unemployment insurance program uh, and all of your employees participate, then your account has been updated into a shared paid leave UI account. When you complete your regular wage filings or wage detail report, that information will persist to the paid leave division without any additional action taken on your part. So it's one return for both programs. For employers that don't participate in the paid leave or in the unemployment insurance program, uh, we do we created a the process for establishing a paid leave only account. This applies to small agricultural uh, employers, religious organizations, and uh, some uh, yeah, religious organizations is a good example uh, of folks that aren't required to participate in the unemployment insurance divisions program, but are another, nevertheless required to participate in paid leave. Those folks can set up a paid leave only account uh, where it's the it looks exactly the same as the UI account, but by doing so, you don't create an unemployment insurance liability. So you don't have to enroll in both programs in order to submit your wage detail report. There's one other group uh, where an employer may have some folks that are required to participate in paid leave or required to participate in unemployment insurance and some that are not. For those, that employer is going to need to set up two accounts. The first one, uh, filing your regular UI uh, wages is going to make you is going to put you in compliance for those employees. For those employees that don't participate in the unemployment insurance divisions program, you'll need to create a paid leave only account just for them. But the uh, file structure is exactly the same as uh, what's currently submitted to the UI program. And for the vast majority of employers, there's no action needed uh, before October 31st to be in compliance. So those first returns are for informational purposes only, but starting in January 1st, 2026, payroll deductions can begin to help fund the program. We're going to have quarterly uh, wage detail reports and premium payments due starting in 2026. The premium rate is similar to the way the program is set up. It's split into a family premium and a medical premium. That is again split into an employer portion and an employee portion. By default, this is 50%. However, that employer portion is a minimum. The employee portion is a maximum, meaning that an employer for competitive purposes may decide to cover more than the, than the required 50%. Employers that have fewer than 30 employees are entitled to a reduced premium. That reduced premium cuts the employer portion in half meaning that the small business rate, uh, the small business premium will be 75% of the size of the regular premium rate. Um, we will get to questions right at the end of the presentation as well. Um, next, coordinating benefits and leave uh, while somebody is out on a leave, on a qualifying leave. So we recognize that employers are very busy uh, very busy people that are coordinating a number of benefits already. 
and that paid leave really can't just exist on its own. It needs to fit into a bigger picture. Um, so we recognize that employers are already balancing things like FMLA, short-term disability, or earn sick and save time. And we want this program to fit into that bigger picture. Um, and so we're going to be providing a lot of guidance on how these benefits coordinate with one another uh, closer to implementation. Uh, but we also want to create uh, processes and systems that allow employers to be able to coordinate any payments to an employee as well as have transparency uh, for when an employee is out on a qualified leave and when they're returning to work. So last two parts, I mentioned small employer assistance is also going live on January 1st, 2026. Uh, this is funding that's earmarked for small businesses when an individual goes out on leave. So the qualifications are that an employer has 30 or fewer employees and that their average employee makes less than 150% of the statewide average annual wage. That's about $105,000. So if you have under 30 employees and your average employee makes less than $105,000, then you'll be eligible for assistance funding when somebody goes out on the leave. This is funding up to $3,000 per absence, and it's earmarked for either hiring temporary workers or increasing your existing workers' wages to substitute for an employee while they're out on leave. We're also going to be issuing community outreach grants, which I spoke about previously, uh, starting in Jan July 2025. Uh, these are dedicated for outreach, education, and technical assistance for employers, employees, and the self-employed. Uh, we're going to be consistently evaluating the effectiveness of our communications to make sure that all parties are able to participate in the program in a way that is beneficial. There's a lot of different ways to stay in touch with us. Um, so January 1st is going to January 1st, 2026 is going is right around the corner. Um, and so we're dedicated to making sure employers have the most in, up to date information possible. One way to keep in touch is to watch our website, uh, paidleave.mn.gov. Uh, we do have a number of FAQs uh, that are populated based off of questions that we receive in sessions just like this. Uh, we've also started development of a resource called an employer toolkit, uh, which is something that we're really trying to build out so that employers have all the information that they need in one place to be able to participate in the program. We have a newsletter uh, that we send out on a monthly cadence. Uh, this provides updates both on implementation as well as uh, questions that we're hearing uh, where new information comes out it becomes available. We tend to flag it in our newsletters. Uh, we're going to do a brief Q&A here, um, but we can also take in questions if we don't get to your questions today or if you feel more comfortable having a one-on-one -on -one instead of asking your question in front of a group like this. Uh, we do have a form available on our website. Uh, where you can send us questions directly, where we'll respond via email. There's also going to be tons of opportunities to continue to engage with us. Um, this isn't our first conversation with the small business uh, group, and it won't be our last. <laughs> um, so we are excited to continue to partner with you all. And as implementation moves forward, there's going to be a lot of opportunity to provide feedback, whether through rulemaking or once we start, uh, as we develop the actual system, testing. Uh, making sure that the tools that we develop provide value and create assets for employers. So with that, those are the, the prepared uh, items that we have for today, but we're hap I'm happy to answer questions that you may have. Great. Thank you, Greg. And surprisingly, we, we do have a couple of, of questions. Whenever you're ready, I will run them right by you. And, and certainly, I, I have a copy of all the questions. I can uh, forward that to... to to you and your staff, Greg. Um, but if you can give a quick answer here, if it's if it works, that's great. So our first question is, are both maternity and paternity covered with 12 weeks of paid leave? OK, um, so maternity and paternity. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, both parents uh, will be eligible for benefits under the program. Uh, it's a it's called bonding leave under our statute, um, but it's uh, available to both uh, birth parents as well as fathers or non-birthing parents. Cool. All right. Uh, next question. 
and there's multiples of this. Can we get a copy of the presentation? We are trying to get that in the chat and I am going to post it on the uh, D website. I have the link in the chat already for the small business call. So yes, you'll have access to the uh, presentation. Uh, this may not be answerable by you, Greg, but maybe us at the small business office. Are S corporation owners included in covered employment if they are not subject to unemployment? Uh, yeah, uh, so there is a, it, it really depends on how you pay yourself and if you qualify as a yep. self-employed individual, um, which we'll provide some guidance on. And uh, Mark, we'll follow up with you on what that guidance is on what self-employed individual means under the statute. Yeah, we, we have, thanks. That's a couple of questions there. Another question is, are S corporation officers eligible? Yes, and just a, a quick uh, note to people, S corp is your tax election with the IRS. It's not necessarily an entity status, but yes, it it does. It's a view of, of your business. Um, next question here, are there high wage earners that would not qualify at all for the benefit, Greg? high wage earners that do not qualify for the benefit. Um, yeah. So I think going back into the uh, eligibility criteria, right? So the, the job protections versus the partial wage replacement. So the job protections kick in 90 days following the date of hire. So you could be a high wage earner that uh, has a qualifying event on day 50 and the job protections don't necessarily apply to you. However, if you've earned uh, about $4,000 is about 5.3% of the statewide average annual wage. Uh, at that point, you are qualified to receive benefit payments for a qualifying event when you're out of work. Okay, looks thing. Very good. Thank you. Um, let's see, we have, um, do you have any examples of employers that uh, do not participate? And again, a reference to an S-Corp. Um, so examples of employers that don't have to participate, they're few and far between. Um, okay. That's the federal government is an example. Uh, but the program is different than the Unemployment Insurance Divisions program. Yes. Uh, and we have our own eligibility criteria. Um, and it's a fair assumption that if you have an employee providing services in the state of Minnesota, that you are covered under the program. Uh, the only exceptions, really, federal government, self-employed individuals, and independent contractors. Gotcha. All right. Uh, what happens to the employee who filled the job for the employee who was on leave? Great. Um, so, if you uh, take advantage of the small and business or small employer funding uh, and hire a temporary employee, uh, their wages would be subject to payroll deductions uh, because they would be. Uh, performing services within the state. However, if they took a qualifying leave during the course of an absence, uh, remember the job protections don't kick in for the first 90 days, but if they are there for more than 90 days uh, and they've qualified financially for the leave, uh, as long as they're qualified as a temporary employee or a term limited employee where they were going to end their employment on an agreed upon date, then there's not an obligation to bring them back. Um, but so it's important that you, uh, if you're hiring a temporary employee to make sure that they know that they're temporary, uh, at that point, uh, as soon as that term has expired, there's no obligation to bring them back. All right, thank you. And I would just like to point out to people, Greg is working without uh, cue cards or a teleprompter. This, this is information that is ingrained uh, in, in him, in himself. Um, uh, I just want to do a quick note to Neela. We have as many questions. We could probably go way past the hour. Do we want to ask maybe about five more questions? Um, and then uh, we can talk about something else in the meeting or we can just run it up to the end of the hour. Do you have an opinion on that, Neela? Let's just continue to go through questions. Let's definitely leave five, 10 minutes for other questions that businesses might have. Um, but Perfect. obviously this is a really timely topic and we have the experts online. So absolutely utilize their expertise. Thanks, Mark. Yes. Thank you, Neil. Yeah, we have Greg helping us and um, presenting and then uh, Linda Miller is helping him also. Next question, Greg, as a sole proprietor, how long does it take for the program benefits to kick in once you register for it? 
Once you register for it, um, can I ask for a little clarification by register? Do you mean registering as an employer to take part in the program or uh, for receiving benefits after an application for benefits is submitted to the department? Yep, and I think whoever posted, sorry, the person who posted that question, I'm just pulling them out of the chat to read them. Yeah, if they want to add the more clarification in there, that's great. Um, let's go to the next one. This is a little bit longer. How will the state interact with the employer and what's the timeline for claim review? The person is great. thinking of cases specifically where the employee FMLA entitlement has been exhausted and the employer is waiting to see if job protection benefits continue beyond FMLA. Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna take that in two separate buckets. Uh, the first one is the interaction with FMLA. Uh, so under the statute, the employer may choose to run FMLA or the parent parental and or pregnancy and parental leave <laughs> program concurrently with paid leave benefits. So it's one allotment if the employer chooses to run those two concurrently. Um, but what is that interaction going to look like with an employer during an application for benefits and the timeline for how that's going to work? Right now, uh, today is a great time for getting feedback on how you want it to work because we're still in the design portion of what this program is going to look like. That said, um, I can speak a little bit about how it's worked in other states, um, particularly in the Massachusetts program, which I was involved in. Um, so let me just walk through that process to kind of give you an idea of how an employer kind of plugs in. Uh, so first requirement under the statute is the same in both Minnesota and Massachusetts, which is that an employee tells an employer in advance of applying for benefits. Uh, so the first question that we ask on our application is, have you told your employer about the need for leave? If you say no, we say, please go tell your employer about the need for yes. leave and then come back to us. If you say yes, we sent an email to the employer directly saying that an application has been started with the division uh, for this employee just to give you a heads up. Um, then the employee would complete an application with a lot of the information that you would expect. Uh, the dates that they want to be out on leave, why they're asking for the time off, as well as submitting uh, evidentiary uh, documentation, uh, like an FMLA form sort of looking thing, uh, in order to justify the need for leave. Uh, that would all be submitted, and then another email would be sent to the employer saying that an application has been submitted with the division. And at that point, we actually sent out a request for information from the employer uh, where we would share some details uh, from the application itself to confirm the validity of the information provided. And we'd ask information like, are, is the employer receiving or is the employee receiving any benefits, uh, employer sponsored benefits during the course of their leave? Uh, just so that we're able to make sure that we pay the right person the right amount and that we're on the same page as the employer about this request for leave. Uh, after the employer provides us with that information, it all goes into an adjudicatory decision uh, where we work through the information provided in the application, uh, wage data, uh, information from a healthcare provider, and from the application itself, as well as any previous use of the program in order to make a decision on whether or not that person is approved uh, for leave. If they're approved, we again tell both the employer and the employee that a decision has been reached on this application. Uh, then uh, during the course of the leave um, in Massachusetts, we had a dashboard uh, that was built with employer feedback uh, that included a list of everyone who has applied uh, for leave with the division, the status of their application. If it's been approved, the schedule of when they're going to be out and when to expect them back to work, uh, as well as if it's an intermittent leave, when you can expect them to be out based off of uh, the uh, information provided in the application as well as benefit payment amounts and dates uh, so that if an employer wants to make payments to an employee during the course of an absence, that they're able to coordinate those effectively. Um, so there's that's what worked for Massachusetts, um, but we're definitely open to design feedback uh, on ways that we would be able to uh, make this program work for Minnesota. Great, very, very great answer. Um, I'm going to go to um, Helen. She's had her hand up for a while. I don't assume she's tired, but Helen, if you want to go ahead and, and ask your question. Uh, let 
Let's see. Hello. Yep, we got gotcha. you. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm a volunteer bookkeeper for a local church, small church. I I don't get paid. That's fine. Um, and I only work a few hours a week, but. The church has our pastor who is 30 hours a week. Um, we have two people that take turns coming in to play for music for Sunday service. They might work two Sundays a month. They might work three Sundays a month. So they might get 36 hours in in a year a piece. Um, we have another person who considered custodian does clean up around the church and up to 40 hours a month. Um, and then they just hired a person for an admin up to 15 hours a week. That's it for employees. Would all of them be covered under this? None of which are um, childbearing age. So, um, yeah, uh, so uh, like we said, uh, it's a different program than unemployment insurance. Uh, so. The, the folks that are excluded from unemployment insurance are not excluded under the paid leave program. There's no ex, it, there's no uh, specific exclusion for folks working for a religious organization under the paid leave program. But I also do want to make sure that um, it's clear that this is not just a maternity paternity leave program. This is also for serious healthcare conditions and for caring for a loved one that has a qualifying condition. In fact, the majority of the claims that we're going to receive are gonna be for medical care, uh, for uh, whether that's elder support or uh, your own healthcare uh, that you're uh, for an event that happens down the road. Okay, but you said seasonal is 150 days per year. Or that's like I said, that's a super narrow exclusion uh, and it's only for uh, businesses that meet those three tests of revenue, uh, industry, sure. and Just, number of days of employment. Okay, but somebody that's not even going to make 40 hours in a year would be, so be el eligible for this? They, the the wages for services provided in Minnesota would be eligible uh, for uh, would be required to be have a payroll deduction or would be required to have a premium uh, for those wages. Um, and just so you know, uh, the eligibility uh, for getting eligible for benefit payments uh, is based off of the totality of employers that you may have. So you may only be working part time a few hours for one employer, but those wages could go into your base period in order to qualify you uh, based off the totality of your employment. So if you have two or three employers, you could still be eligible for the program. Wow. All right. Thanks, Greg. Let's go to uh, Dawn. You had a question. You have your hand up. See if we can get her understand. to understand. Okay, go ahead. Can you help me understand why it's only the hospitality industry? I'm a little bit confused because there are some seasonal businesses which only generate their revenue in the summer, for example. And maybe they're mm -hmm. a small business who only has one or two key employees. And then if that employee decides they're going to take their bonding during the summer, it could essentially shut that small business down. Is there is there any reason why it's limited to seasonal employees only in hospitality? Um, so I can't speak to the legislative intent. Um, our team is dedicated to implementing the statute as it's written. Um, so that's the way that the law is written. Um, so we're not able to extend it outside of uh, the seasonal hospitality. Um, so that that's kind of where it is. Is that's just the way that the law is written. Okay, thank you, Greg. Uh, Janine, you had your hand up. You want to go ahead? I wanted to kind of shift gears a little bit and just talk about the community outreach grant that you guys are going to be looking for um, individuals to respond to that. RFP, like, do you specifically, other than informing the community, like, do you guys have a kind of scope to kind of see how we can educate ourselves to get ready for that RFP? 
Um, it's currently a uh, work in progress. Uh, one area to check out is our rulemaking portion of our website because we are accepting uh, comments on a variety of different topics. And I believe the, uh, well, I know the em small employer assistance grants eligibility criteria is there, um, but as uh, information kind of becomes available, we'll make sure to publish it online and to share it with uh, uh, Mark and Neela as well. Thank okay, you, Greg. Thank you. Got time for just a couple more questions. Uh, uh, Kathy, you have your hand up. Wanted to know, um, so we have hundreds of S Corp businesses. They have employees, but the officers excluded. So is my understanding correct that we have to create a separate account to report the officer's wages? Um, or is there any way that the UI can actually, they know that they're an officer, we can report the wages with the UI return and just make those non-taxable wages when it comes through versus having a separate account. So unfortunately it would require a separate account. Uh, and uh, the reason to do that is that um, the wage detail file format has been consistent for a number of years um, and employers are quite used to using it. Uh, so after consulting with uh, groups like uh, the Payers Association, uh, determined this seems to be the least administratively burdensome way of taking in uh, the wage detail information. So the return looks exactly the same uh, for both of those, but there are two in that scenario. In your experience, is that in other states happen as well? Um, as a service payroll service bureau, uh, we're not set up to report those under a different account. Um, wow. Um, and how else are you promoting this to those religious organizations? How are they going to know that this program exists and they now have to do it? Are you promoting that to them or, uh, uh, yeah, uh, or something? <laughs> so as I mentioned, uh, we've done over a hundred, uh, engagement sessions today. Uh, we're also working on, uh, direct outreach, uh, for providers, uh, to make sure that folks are aware of, of the wage reporting requirement, uh, that's going live. But we're also you know, dedicated to making sure that we're partnering to get folks into compliance. We're not here to nickel and dime folks. We're not here to create to punish folks for uh, if it's something outside of their control where they're not able to participate. So we are actively looking for ways to uh, get to those groups as well. OK, thank you, Greg. Uh, I'll take one uh, kind of a compound question here. See if you can answer this, Greg. Uh, one of the first part of the questions is, does this affect staff that live in another state but work in Minnesota? And does it affect employees that work in Minnesota but live in another state that already have paid leave? Which employer, uh, which employer contributes to it? I think that's the question. Great. Uh, yeah, so just like the unemployment insurance program, we have a localization test. Uh, so there's two tests here uh, for a multi-state employer and it's done at the individual employee level. Uh, the first is uh, that an employee, if 50% or more of the services are provided within the state of Minnesota, that individual is covered by the program. However, if uh, an individual doesn't, have, because the work is localized to Minnesota. However, there are situations where the work isn't localized in any particular jurisdiction. So you could spend a third of your time in Minnesota a third of your time in Iowa, a third of your time in South Dakota. In that case where you don't have 50% of your services being provided in any specific state, then it matters where you live. Uh, so in, if you don't have localized services in a single state, but you live in Minnesota, then you're covered. Um, so it's just like the unemployment insurance program in that respect, that if the services are being provided mostly in Minnesota, somebody that you are covered by the program. All right, thank you, Greg, and thank you, Linda. Just five minutes left. I think we'll. Um, what I will do is I will pull the rest of the questions out. I can work with you and Greg behind the scenes, uh, you and Linda, and um, see if you want to take the questions that haven't been answered yet, and I can I can get those to you. Uh, we will have the slides for the PowerPoint presentation. I'll have that uh, up on the uh, uh, Small Business Assistance Office Small Business Call. Uh, page that links also in the in the chat. Um, 
So certainly, thank you for your time. And for all the people who ask questions, we will try and get those answered. Uh, Neela, I think we had another thing to talk about uh, today from the uh, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. And I got to get you off mute. Yes, uh, the yes. Minnesota Chamber is doing a, a fun competition about great things being uh, developed here in Minnesota. So you can right. vote. Uh, it's the second round, and I will get that link uh, put in the chat. Unless yeah, you it's have in that. there. No, okay, great. Just wanted yep. to highlight Minnesota Chamber and the work that they're doing. They're one of our partners on this call. Um, once again, I want to thank Mark for, for leading this from our small business assistance team. We also have our small business development team who helps with these um, and the SBA who is a partner across the state. So Absolutely. just thought that was a, a, a good um, competition for you to provide your vote about some of the innovative businesses across the state. We also have a newsletter from our Office of Small Business and Innovation um, that we'll put the link in there for you too. So you can um, be reminded every month of some of the, the, the activities and resources uh, that is coming up for you. But thank you, Greg and his right. team. And thank you, Mark, for getting um, this organized and, and more answers out uh, to the Absolutely. Businesses. We know it's a lot of information to digest. All right. So with that, that was a, a quick hour. So thanks, everybody. We'll be back next month. Uh, you can go out to the uh, DEED website. You can search for the small business call. Um, and the link will be there for the meeting recordings. Each month is recorded, and I will get that information up and out to people as soon as possible. So with that, bye, everybody.